Welcome to the Garage Network Podcast. Join us and the occasional special guest as we discuss everything automotive, from fixing cars as a technician, owning an automotive workshop or business, overall work-life balance, and even the occasional laugh. In this episode of TGN Talks, we were lucky enough to sit down with Jeff. Jeff is the CEO of the VACC, and we get to learn what the VACC does and who they actually are. We also talk a little bit about politics and the automotive industry. Also learn about Jeff's career and also goals for the VACC going forward. We really hope that you guys enjoy it. Okay, so today we've got Jeff from VACC. Good morning, Jeff. How are we? Good morning, guys. How are you? We're really good. Very well. Okay, so I think we'll allow you to probably give a bit of a introduction about who you are and where you're yep. from. Um, probably let the listeners know you are from obviously the VACC. And you can give us a bit of a rundown about uh, what you do at the VACC. Yep. And okay. a little bit about um, what the VACC is doing. Okay, well, first of all, the, the Victorian Automotive Chamber of Commerce, we we're 103 years old. We're an employer association. Uh, we've got uh, around 5,000 members. Um, you know, our job is to provide advocacy. Number one priority of any association is that to advocate advocate on behalf of its members. What does that mean? It means get in front of government, get in front of politicians, um, and we 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 you know buried in our state politics, of course, but we also engage as a collective through our national body, the MTAA, and the other MTAs uh, on national uh, policy. And we're on about policy. It can range from tax policy that affects the industry, um, access to repair information type policy is about obviously access in the way that people do their business in automotive, uh, unfair contract terms. So any uh, issues that are affecting the industry, and most state issues are national issues as well, our job is to get in front of politicians and to make sure that their policies, that they're writing you know, a year or two years before they're, they're even re-elected in reflect the policies that what, that we need in the industry. So I've got a, a team of policy people here. They're called industry policy advisors, and their job is to work with the different divisions. We've got 15 divisions here and to actually bring all of that information in, and, and we build our own policy manifesto at a, for a state and federal elections, and then we actually send that out to every politician, state and federal, so they know what we want. And one of the things that associations often miss or they they get to the gate too late is they have an idea and they approach a politician after an election. So a party gets in, somebody runs up to the business, small business minister, and says, oh, by the way, we need this for the automotive industry. Well, you needed to have been there two years ago. So often when you're hearing politicians talk about their policy manifesto, that's been influenced by a whole lot of people from industry and out of associations that have already uh, spent a lot of time with different politicians to try and make sure they understand the issue and consequently they follow that through in their own policies. But, you know, one thing that, you guys and your and your, your your network need to know is is that if you can't make your policy need align to their policy need, it ain't getting up. So you've got to work out what, which minister do I need to speak to about what issue, and how do I collectively um, make that work? And one of the things about the the VACC and the other associations is that because we've been around a long time and you've got good branding in your states and nationally, you can get good access to uh, ministers and advisors and chiefs of staff and those sorts of people. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm going around a bit here, Costa, I'm trying to answer your question about what we do. But that, no, you're right, you're right. That policy and advocacy is absolutely um, the centrepiece. Then we move over to things like industrial relations advice, occupational health and safety advice, um, and now I've got another team of people here, so an employer's out there and they've got all sorts of trouble with their staff or there's new regulations or legislation. And our job is to, you know, take we take 
thousands and thousands of calls every all year around um, what do I do? Get me out of the glue. Um, I want to restructure my business. How do I do it? Um, you know, I've, I've had to sack somebody. I need some guidance on that. So that industrial relations advice, uh, coupled with the policy advice, they're, they're really central planks of what we do. And of course, we've got a big um, a group training scheme here. We've got 500 apprentices between here and Tasmania. Um, and a, a big part of that is about supply of labour to the industry. And we'll talk a bit about that later, Costa, when we talk about that, that supply stuff. Mike and I were talking about it just a moment ago. Um, uh, it's, it's about our responsibility to bring those young people through and to make sure that we, we're assisting as much as we possible with, with uh, quality supply of labour and skilled labour into the industry. And just on that, um, and I'll use an example of, the fe- of what we're doing federally, so we're spending a lot of time with Minister Robert at the moment talking about international labour. And, and our job at the moment is to convince the federal government that automotive is in huge critical skill shortage, because it is, so that when they start to uh, move forward with their new policy around migrant intake, skilled migrant intake, family migrant intake, that there's enough people coming through those intakes to supply uh, labour. I mean, it's, it's, it's a reality that supply of labour in this industry is both domestic and international, um, but we've got to make sure that, again, that we're influencing enough people to make sure that the numbers of, the, of uh, international intakes high enough for us to give some supply to the industry. Yeah, wow. Well. Mm. A lot of coverage. I was going to go, yeah, and I guess a lot of us just don't understand that background work and the amount of effort and the planning that goes into that. Oh, it's huge. Many years in advance and helping those, it's also part of helping those politicians come through and and get elected, I'm assuming, as well. That's part of, and you've got to make sure you back the right side. Well, it's interesting, Mike. Um, You So access to repair information, I would argue, took 12 to 15 years, Okay. Uh, changes to the franchise code for automotive dealers, again, took over a decade to actually make sure that we were at the position where we are now. Uh, unfair contract terms, um, really, that's huge for body repairers. Um, there's new legislation being finished now. We've got collective bargaining legislation that's went through last uh, earlier this year. Again, 12, 15 years to get that stuff through. Um, and Mike, your point is this, and it's a really good one. So you can spend a lot of time. So you've got this minister lined up, okay, and you're thinking they're currently the opposition minister for, um, let's say, skills and training, all right? And uh, so you're spending a lot of time. You're sending them information. You've had 15 coffees. You know, you keep, you're going backwards and forwards. The opposition get into power, and guess what? They reshape the portfolios. So the person that you were talking to about education training, no, no, they're, they're in public health now. There's a new person called Eric that's arrived that's in charge of education, doesn't know anything about education training. Start they, the system again. You have to go all the way back. Um, I'll give you a good example. You'll love this. So my one of my advisors here, John Curry, um, we were spending a lot of energy with access to repair information, which for people's information isn't about dealers versus independent repairers. It's about having the same amount of information available to the market so consumers get good choice <clears throat> and, and, and lots of dealers repair lots of models of cars. So they need it as well. But it's just about having a level playing field. It is certainly not pitting, pitting dealers against independent repairers. It's a, that's ridiculous. It's not useful at all. So anyway, so John Curry and I, we were seeing a lot of politicians federally and at the state level. And we eventually said, look, what we're going to do, we're going to take these a new tie valve with us into these conversations. You know, the ones with little computer chips in, they give you a dash uh, thing that says, by the way, your tie's flat. And I've, and I've got to tell you these guys, this stuff, guys, because it's really phenomenal. So if you sit in front of a politician, okay, and you're talking about access to repair information, they don't know what you're talking about. They've got no idea. 
And then you talk about their car, and they still don't have any idea whatsoever. But if you put something on the table, and the thing about this valve is, is they're cheap, and I, I, we bought like 200 of them, and we'd leave them with the minister. And we said, look, here's a valve for your car tyre. You've got a new car. This is what's in your car. They go, oh, really? Go, yeah, have a look at it. They go, what's that knobbly bit on the end? There's a computer in there. Really? Yeah, what that computer does, it tells your car that your tyre's flat, and it might be unsafe. And actually, this might be around the safety of the whole vehicle. Really? However, some independent repairers can't get the data to recalibrate that valve. No. Yes. So that's why we need access to repair information for all people that repair cars and businesses that repair cars. They go, oh, well, like that, of course. Okay. But if yeah, you, that makes sense straight away. That makes okay, sense. It makes yeah. sense straight. But if you walk in with with a uh, an electronic control unit or a computer, yeah. they're not going to know what a module is. Yeah, that's right. They don't know. They don't know anything. Okay, yeah. but I'm just using that as a really good example of um, what you need to do, how how you need to approach people um, politically around trying to explain how the industry works, because unless you can convince them that. This is about them, and they they're part of this supply chain. It, you're just talking a whole lot of gobbledygook, and they they're not really going to kind of. They don't they don't absorb it. I suppose that's the same as educating people. I mean, it's a, we're, we're a lot of the practical. I guess that's the same as practical learning. You know what I mean? Showing someone something yeah. and putting it into a practical sense. Uh, and during that, yeah, and during that repair legislation, I was my local member was Craig Laundie, who at the time was oh, a yeah. small and yeah. family business member who was in charge of that. And then overnight, I got because I I can I can visualize exactly what you guys must go through because I was doing that. I he had a team of people who was booked in to come down, and I was going to show him some of the programming stuff yep. that we do and how simple it is. And overnight, he was no longer that minister. He was no longer in politics, and it was it was that's right. It was all over. It was back to zero. Back to square one. And I was I was it was just like oh my god, we were that close. You know, it felt like it just felt like it was we were, you know it was it was yeah. Anyway. You know you've won when you hear a story of that minister talking to another minister about the valve and they've got it in their hand going, do you know how this works? And do you know there's a computer in there? So when that happens, you know that you've got breakthrough. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. We would have here, though, um, and it would be the same with our colleagues in the state and with the national body, we'd have 50 to 20 policy issues that we're talking to ministers and senior advisors about all the time now. So I could give you our portfolio now, and there's a list of things that we're talking about um, that are really important to the industry. Um, you know, we're looking for a new body repair code in Victoria, for example. So that's been going for about five years. Um, but, you know, with the departments on board, they've got people working on it. And, and, you know, so A, there's a lot of stuff on the menu, but B, uh, even when you're talking to politicians, um, you've also got to factor in who's the chief advisor, who's the chief administrator, who's the person down here that's actually got to put it on their workload that you've also got to convince. So we spend a lot of time, uh, ministers are great in terms of making relationships and, and getting your ideas across. But ultimately, you've got to get down to the person that's going to do the work and you've got to convince them that it's all going to be okay and you're going to go on the journey with them. Uh, ministers come and go, but administrators normally don't in government. They're there for a very long time and you've got to develop relationships that are sustainable um, and and trust you've got to have trust in those relationships as well. That's that's really important. Mm. Yeah, I think that's very important. I think in the whole industry as a whole, I think hearing just this communication side of things, I think that that sort of relationship is very important along the way. It, it, it is costly, and I think in automotive we are very. Ver I, I can. I, I'm going to tell you something, okay? And you you have to agree with me because you can't deny it. Um, we yeah. are a verbal industry. We're in industry about talking to people and we're in industry about relationships. Now, I can tell you that 100%. when I send out a bulletin to 5,000 members and only 5% of them read it, I can tell you that we're not 
we, we as, an, as an industry, we read stuff we need to know to fix something, all right? We're good on that, you know? Uh, and, and that one we can't work it out, by the way. If we can if we can not read anything, that's the first thing is don't read anything, have a go at it. The second thing is to somebody throw the box out because I need it back. <laughs> the third thing is I'll have a look on the internet because it's bound to be there. Um, but we're a very verbal industry and I and we're quite good at it. And and that's fan. I mean, I love this industry because it is very much about people and, and discussions. Um We've got a technical area here. So I'll talk a bit about, about our tech centre. Um, so uh, we run a, we've got a, a, a group of guys upstairs. They take about 50,000 calls a year and they run what used to be called tech centre, which is now Motor Tech, uh, which is our joint relationship with Haynes Publishing. And, uh, and even today, uh, even with all of that technology out there in the industry, and all of that information available, and our own products, you know, Motor Tech, we're out there selling it. It's a really good product. One of the, it's the best you'll buy because we've got a, this technical centre attached to it. These guys still take calls every day from, from our members. Oh, look, you know, I want to be able to fix this. No, I don't know. We're after some sort of technical stuff. All right. Have you, have, you got the, have you got the scan tool there? Have you got the other stuff in front of you? Are you ready to go? But often it's the dialogue. It, you, these guys want to know, Look, just tell me what to do. You know, I've got all the gear here. I think it's going to take me a long time. And we've got the one of the biggest technical libraries for automotive in the Southern Hemisphere here. It is absolutely massive. And our guys still, they take a call, they go to a shelf, they pull a book off, find the answer, they scan it up into our library platform, and a member goes and looks at it and downloads it. And um, I think even though we've got a whole lot of new products uh, on the market, I still think that that tech centre will be, that that call centre will be working in 10 years because there's still a group of members uh, that, um, yeah, they'll use the other stuff when they can. And, of course, you actually can't operate a workshop nowadays without scan tools and diagnostic equipment. But there's still a group of members that will just want to ring somebody and say, look, I've got this bloody, you know, 1982 Ford Falcon and the thing, I need the firing order, I need to know what this is. And um, it's, a, it's a great resource, but it, it just proves to me um, that, uh, can I tell you guys a secret? It's just us on the call, isn't it? Yeah, we love secrets. Michael loves <laughs> secrets. You don't tell me, I'm, I, I'm not good at holding them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I came into this job about uh, seven years ago. I used to work here 20 years ago, and I went and ran some other um, – I ran the National uh, Skills Advisory Body for Automotive, uh, Auto Skills, and I ran the National Advisory Body for Transport and Logistics. And uh, so then I came back here, and um, we've got field managers. They go out and they visit members, and they have a whole lot of dialogue, a whole lot of chat. And um, I, I sort of sat here and thought, you know – what we, we've got this marketing area and we do a lot of marketing to our members and marketing to the public. I'm going to tell you guys now, okay, seven years later, the single biggest value to a whole lot of my members is somebody turning up to talk to them. Oh, well, it's my me, yeah. or an area manager, yeah. uh, somebody out of my technical area, there is this engagement um, that is still ho- highly powerful in this industry because uh, members are busy. They can't read it. We sent a whole lot of stuff out of here. They can't read half of it anyway in terms of their time and their what they're trying to go through their, their day. But if you turn up and you want to talk about the industry, hear their problems, Tell them about what we're doing in, in our technical area, in our policy area, in commercial, in IR, and actually, they, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's just it's taken me a long time to understand the profound value of that service to members. It's very expensive. It's very expensive for people on the road. We've got the cars badged up. Um, the other MTAs do all this as well, but it's it's incredibly valuable. And, uh, you know, if I went to my board tomorrow, again, I'm just telling you guys all my secrets, okay? Uh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll keep it between us, mate. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, get that, <laughs> I get that, Jeff, because it's, 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 it's not an industry where uh, I think that's in other states, other MTAs don't do it as well, I don't think. I, I can 
Um, but I think that it's, we're very we're very hands on and face to face and want to talk about stuff. If someone comes in and talks to you about it, send an email. Yeah, I'll get to it. I'll look at it later. Yeah. And then you, and you you buggered you at the end of the day. You don't want to yeah. you don't want to think about it. You don't want to worry about it, and you move on from it. You know, I think there's someone said something. Just to recap on what you were just doing talking about a minute ago with with what you guys are doing. Someone said on one of the Facebook groups. Uh, what's the point of being part of an association or being a member of an association? Yeah. What is the use of these associations? I don't yeah. think people really realise what you guys do yeah. on a day-to-day basis. What are the, you know, the, all of these groups and, and they're out there representing your interests. And if yeah. you're not if you're not involved with them and you're not giving them your feedback, they are not going to do what they what you Absolutely. want. Absolutely. Right? Like it's really, it's a really important message. Neil, Associations were, were they sort of Edwardian and Victorian in design. Industrial Revolution, people collected up in Australia, you know, 120 years ago, motor cars were starting to come through. The oil industry was being particularly problematic in terms of how, how it supplied oil and petrol to suppliers. And, uh, you know, these associations started to form themselves groups of small businesses, uh, repairers and dealerships, farm machinery dealerships, and most of them started in regional areas, by the way. They didn't start in metropolitan areas. They started out there. And um, one of the things that um, if, if, if automotive don't have uh, peak bodies, you do not have a voice. I can tell you this. I can tell you this for nothing. If you, if you don't have a, a peak body or even a national body, you will not get into government because it's too easy for, a, for an advisor to say, or who are you, or we don't recognise you, or, you know, so it doesn't doesn't matter whether you think your national or your state body is doing a good or a bad job, okay? And I'm going to give you the solution to that in a minute. The point is, is if you don't have one, you will, you automotive will slip off of the radar. Um, and I can, I can just tell you that from my own experiences, and I've been in and around lots of associations for a long time. Um Sometimes members of associations want associations to be angry and aggressive, okay? Go to government, tell them what to do, and you've got to get it changed, Jeff, and, uh, you know, we've got to give them a hard time, okay? Now, there are very few occasions where you would do that because you need to go back, and you need to go back next week, and you need to go back next month. It's a relationship, like you were saying earlier. That's right, Costa. Those administrators and those senior advisors, they're still there. They're in for 25, 30 years, okay? So if you want to go hard and give them a kicking, great, go for it. You'll get one go. So the job of an association is to actually take all of that input from the members and then distill that and make a decision. This comes to your point, Mike, about how are you going to approach this? Is, Is, you know, how am I going to get this issue on the table and how do I do that carefully so that I don't spill the milk and the shutters come down and then if people have a view oh government can't do that they can and they do and if you annoy the wrong people federally and at a state level if you annoy the wrong people like your businesses guys if you guys if if a customer comes into your business and they give you a kicking, and they they abuse you, and they and they they're rude and obnoxious. You're not going to serve them. You're going to. I know what you're going to do. You're going to say, "Mate, you see that door? Get your ass out that door because it's it's your space." Okay. Well, you might serve them that one time, but you're not going to be happy next time they come in. You might be well, like, you're sorry, not, mate. Actually, I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> and you would make the call as a business person, Costa, about who you who you want to provide services to. Now, that doesn't mean that you you don't put up with difficult customers. Of course you do. But there are certain people, I guarantee that certain people that you would say, do you know what? If they never came here again, I don't care because they're so much of a pain, I don't need it. Well, people in all jobs are like that, that they don't want to deal with people that are rude or obnoxious. Um, So we have to find ways of, of, of... helping people in departments do things they might not want to do. Um, and, of course, the best way to get that is to get the minister to tell them to do it. But, you know, that that, that doesn't always work that way either. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the, 
Um, one of the things I've uh, for members is that often associations have got lots of avenues for members to have input into the associations. And I would say to any person, this is, this is my first rule. If you're not happy with your association, you need to tell them why. If you don't want to be a, a member of the association, you know, ask yourself why and, and what would happen if you didn't have an association. And if you think it can do a better job, get on a committee and inform. If you're not in the, if, you know, you, you need to put yourself 100%. in an environment where you can influence. So if you think, oh, Gwillem's in there and uh, I've heard him on the radio and I don't reckon he's up to much and I need to give him a hard time. Great. Get on a committee. Get in here. Put some time in. Tell me what you think I should be doing. Not a problem. Send me an email. I'll tell you where the committee forms are. So, so that engagement is, is entirely, um, you know, we are entirely reliant on that engagement from, from members and, um, and I, I think there's a great education for members on committees. I mean, committees are they're terrible from an administrative point of view because they can drain a lot of energy. However, if you've got a really vibrant committee that's doing good work and they're creating uh, or reflecting really good policy that's needed in the industry, you can actually do a lot with that. You can make a lot of energy out of that. And um, there's nothing better than standing in front of a minister and telling the minister, well, actually, I spoke to 12 people from industry last night and they told me this is a real issue and that's why we need to move on it. And if you want to meet them, I'll tell you when the next meeting is and, and we'll get you into that meeting. Yeah, Mag that's, that's absolutely magnificent. I, yeah, I think that's you've got to get engaged. And there's so many people out there that just yell from the sidelines about everything that's wrong with our industry and they go, well, yeah. what are you doing to help? Like it's it's 90 percent of these things are volunteer associate like people yeah. are volunteering their time to do the to yeah. do the work you know and and, it's, and and there's a it's a that's a really that's a big problem I think that, that we you know people have got to get involved and they've got to help because no one we've all got to do a bit of lift do a bit of lifting you know Can I, 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 want, I just want to come to that minute Mike now the, your your listeners can't see this but behind me is a picture that picture behind me guys is the new building we're moving from St Kilda Road to North Melbourne in February next year, okay? They're just finishing off the building now. One of the things we've been doing here is scanning a whole lot of records. We've got, I've got 50,000 member records from, that go back a long, very long time, obviously. When you go into the, the old ball papers and the old committee papers, because we've been scanning them in like crazy, when you read in those papers, okay, so John Jones from Mildura came to the committee meeting and he talked about a shortage of farm machinery being imported into Australia, okay? That person, the voice of that person, that one person that ran, runs a business in Mildura or Shepparton or where it happens to be, that goes onto a piece of paper that ends up forming part of a policy that changes legislation or rules for importation, you know, anybody that thinks that their time isn't valuable, it's incredibly valuable, but it's it's the when I look through these papers, 1916, um, sorry, 1918, all the way through to today, and it, they're rich. I mean, I get carried away with it. I could read these things for bloody years because it's the conversations about what's happening in industry that they're fascinating. Yeah, and uh, they are individuals that decided to make a contribution over a period of time, and I value them highly. And uh, I go out, I, I do our 50 and 75 and 100 year certificates here. So just for your information, in the Motor Trades Association, the individual isn't the member, the business is. The business is a member and the individual is the nominated person from that business. But um, we've all got members. We've got two over 100 years. That business has been a member for 100 years, okay? Well, that would be the and same. You put it around. Well, I gave a 75-year a, a um, certificate to a panel beater about two weeks ago. We did it over Zoom because it's in COVID and unfortunately it wasn't that well. When you sit down and talk to these people, the, the, their businesses, so it, they, it came through the family, either the dad had it or the parents had it, and they, they talk to you about their journey over that long period of time. I write, I, I 
just write the stories up or the, the marketing team here go through all the information, write the, the stories up. They are fascinating stories about people's endeavours and endurance through a very long period of time. And, um, yeah, associations are about members. There aren't, there's no such thing as an association. If we don't have – associations, in my view, need two things. They need money and they need members. They need members to be viable and to have a purpose. They need money to take a call to action and to turn it into policy, all right? So that's why membership fees, nobody likes to be paying membership fees, but if we don't have any money, we can't do, we can't do anything. Uh, we, need a, we need enough members so that a politician knows, if I don't talk to this association, it doesn't matter what association, by the way, that I'm going to actually annoy a lot of people. So the contributions in time and effort that those people put in, you know, I've got people that have been on committees for 20 or 30 years, it's phenomenal. Um, but, um, you know, the combination of their, their time and their resource and their effort and their financial contribution, contributions from members, they're, they're incredibly powerful things and uh, we, we can't do what we do here without them. Yeah, Jeff, I was going to ask you what you did beforehand, but I was going to just quickly tell you, I don't know if you know, but my grandfather started our business in 1916. Wow, man. So, we've been, so we had, these are some of the, I think you can see these old petrol signs. I can, now. I can see them, yeah. They're, um, they're, uh, they're from uh, COR, from Commonwealth Oil Refinery. Yeah. And then some of them, Dad was cleaning them a while ago, and on, on the front of them, it's got... Uh, they were starting to spray paint BP over where it had COR when British Petroleum. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, yeah, so we've been going for – unfortunately for us, the business has had to change names because it was family – with my aunties and uncles and, and and every time we've had to buy the business and, and we've changed names three times. Yeah, but that happens. We, we've got some great old books here that go yeah. right back to um, – I think one of your guys from your library wanted to, he said, if you ever want to get rid of any of your books in your library here, Mike, yeah. buy them with you. Um, let me the, know. The, the problem with is my technical guys, Mike, and they'll probably listen to this and they'll, they'll, they'll come and sort me out, okay? Um, they collect, collect books from everywhere. I'm moving into a brand new building. I need half of one floor for my bloody library. <laughs> but I can't stop them. And actually, I'm guilty of it as well because I bought some books recently and um sent them to the library uh again <laughs> you could spend years up there um, I, I love i love looking at all the old the the, the old ads and the i think yeah. you looking at some of the ones here some of the and, I've, and the old work so some of them are questionable yeah some of these <laughs> they, are today. they yeah. are today they are today yeah. The, the the and speaking of associations, we came from. I came from. A, we had service stations and workshops, and we were members of the SSA and trying to get through. That I, I I was only a baby at the time, but I remember the petrol strikes of the nineteen seventies yeah, right. and and the, and the stresses that my dad and, and my uncle. Yeah. And, you know, we had four service stations here in Sydney, so you know, yeah. like it was it was um yeah it was it was really hard to you know. But again, those associations helped. Yeah, well. Sometimes we can do a lot. Sometimes we can guide. Sometimes we can advise. But you know, so we, when needed, we can get angry, Mike. And um, you know, <laughs> we uh, politicians need to be re-voted in as well. So you know, there's a there's a playoff there. So hey. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so Jeff, what did you do before you were in the VAC? So you always been at the VACC, or what? No, the- no, no. So I started my life in the UK. I came out here when I was 25, and. Um, uh, I wonder about panel beater, okay? So on the weekends, I used to work with this guy called Royston. He's in WA, and uh, he used to repair cars in a, in a big old, it was actually a coach house uh, to a, an old mansion. The mansion had, had burned down, and he lived in the mews next to it. And I and there was this coach house was his workshop, okay, cobbled floors and all that. A lovely guy, dear friend, um, and, and I still talk to him from time to time now. Uh, so I wanted to be a, 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 I thought I'd be a panel beater, okay, because my two best subjects at school were English and metalwork, okay. Now, work that out. Um, I, I loved English and I loved metalwork, so I don't know, maybe I should have been a, a, a sign writer. Engraver, a really good engraver. <laughs> a good engraver. You know, what, Mike, what did I think of that? So my dad came home one day and he said, um, oh, I've, got a, I've got a Saturday job for you, and I went, Oh, yeah, you know, I, I was 15 at the time. Uh, I had a couple of jobs and, um, you yeah, know, after school and weekends. And um, he said, yeah, you go up 
to the, it was called the fort. So in the south of England, they built all these forts. Um, this was before the Second World War, by the way. Uh, none of them were ever used, but they turned them into industrial estates. And okay, mine was at this place called Fort Ferry. And he said, go up to the fort, they they build truck bodies up there. You're working up there on Saturday. So, okay, so I ride my bike up there on a Saturday morning. And uh, I remember this day, um, how old am I now? I'm 61, so I was 15 at the time. So I walk into this um, workshop and this guy says, uh, uh, my dad's name was Eddie. And he said, are you Eddie's boy? I said, yeah. He goes, you're over there with that guy. He points to this guy on this truck body, okay? Um, it was a big, um, it was a 40-footer. They were building, they were refrigerated containers, so he was doing the floor. I walk over. He says, um, yeah, there's the drill there, mate. You better start drilling the holes out. Now, luckily, I'd had some rudimentary training on all this sort of stuff with my mate Royston and a uh, school in metalwork. And I just thoroughly loved it, okay? So at the end of the day, I worked for the whole day. They didn't pay you to do this sort of stuff back then. It was sort of like, say, you go and we'll make a judgment. So at the end of the day, this guy comes over, and his name was John McComiskey, and we called him Bomber because at that time, unfortunately, we had these big fractions with the Irish and, you know, there was a lot of bombings going on, which was a very sad time. But because he was from Ireland, we just called him Bomber, Okay. I never called him that to his face because he was a really big bear, okay? So uh, Bomber's walking towards me and you're just scared. This, you're scared even looking at this guy because he's really angry. He's got the big red cheeks and the hair everywhere. And and he says, um, I don't know, I can't do an Irish accent, so I won't even try. And he says, um, you Eddie's boy? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, you did okay today. You start on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your Sunday job, was it? So that was, yeah, that was a Saturday job. That was a Saturday, okay. Yeah, you started on uh, Monday. <laughs> Monday, so I go home and I said to Dad, hey, Dad, I was up at the fort today and I worked on trucks all day and I, on truck bodies and I really liked that. And they said I can start on Monday. Now, my uh, academic capabilities at school were I would categorise off average, okay. Um, I love school for the social environment at school. I love my mates and all that sort of stuff. And I really wasn't that focused on academic work at all, apart from English. <laughs> and uh, so I, on the following Monday, I, I go back there and they put me with a gang and we're building these big uh, Pantex and refrigerated vehicles. And I just started my apprenticeship as a body maker. So, you know, we we're still doing fiberglass there, a bit of wood involved, aluminium, sheet metal, all that sort of stuff. Really enjoyed it. Went to the local college in Portsmouth, Highbury College. And uh, Thatcher years came in, moved my apprenticeship to Southampton in the last year, worked in, in uh, specialist uh, containerised work there for a year, really enjoyed it. So my, my apprenticeship, I look back on it with great fondness and I met some really good people. And then um, I couldn't work out what's happening. My dad kept telling me to go overseas and I really just think he wanted me to leave. So um, so I went to Europe for a while, then I came back and he said, I'll try America. And I went to America for a little while and came back and he went, you really need to try Australia, Jeff, give that a crack. And, uh, and I'm thinking, so something got, I'm not working this. Then they started to downsize the house, went from four bedroom to three bedroom. And I, the, the writing's on the wall here. I had plans in place, mate, they had plans right? in place. Yeah. So um, I come out of Australia and I'm doing crash repairs on at Australian Pacific Tours uh, big, they, they do around Australia. They used to do Australian uh, buses and they, the, the, the buses used to come mangled up, so you do the body and fix them up. Re yeah. I worked on trains at Comenge for a while, building trains. I'd worked at British Rail before in the UK, I a carriage building in the railway works at Eastleigh. And um, and one day, I, I, don't, I don't even know what happened. I don't know why, uh, and why I did this. I looked in, I was, I was repairing buses okay, and I looked in the yellow pages and I thought, I'm, I'm going to go and work in a technical college. And God knows why I thought this okay. And there was this um, John Batman, it's actually called the Batman Institute back then, Batman Institute of TAFE. Now, I, don't, I didn't even know John Batman was a, 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 one of the earlier pe early people that opened up Melbourne at the time. I ring this number, this bloke picks up the phone, Ralph here. Uh, uh, now, they hadn't employed a teacher for like 15 years. And it was the only place in Victoria that delivered body-making training 
And at that time, in that week, they needed a part-time trainer. It's <laughs> unbelievable, this thing. What's that for timing? So, so I go down there, start some training. Loved it. My employer said, we don't care. If you if you give us 40 hours work a week, 40, 40 hours a week, Jeff, I was a good spray painter. I was a good repairer. Um, so every Friday I went down to the TAFE, did a part-time teacher training course. About a year later, full-time in the TAFE, did a, a, a diploma of technical teaching. About three years later, I started to move into different parts of the institute. It was only a fully automated institute. Went into curriculum and curriculum management because my writing skills, I was a very good writer, so they picked up very quickly. This bloke can put words together and he can spell, he can do all sorts of things. Then I did a Bachelor of Education and then I did a Master's of Education. So I'm, I'm, I left school at 15, okay? I did City and Guilds, did my apprenticeship. And uh, 20 years later, I'm doing a Master's of Education. I enjoyed that. So that was my journey and I really loved that journey. But all the way through that, I've, I've maintained a close affinity with industry. Um, this might sound weird to some of your listeners, Costa, okay? There's nothing perverted about it, but I just want to share this, okay? It's a deep, dark secret. Again, it's just a secret between friends, mate. No one knows. It's all good. Yeah, just it's us. just us. No one else is here. Just the three of us. Is okay? When I walk into a workshop, I love the smell of metal. I love the smell of oil. That whole thing to me brings my whole life back to me. And... Uh, I love all of that stuff. So, so it's um, it's uh, you know, it's a real thing that you can get connected to this industry and having a real affinity with it. But the stories, the the, I'm actually interested in other people's stories, and I love listening to them. And uh, yeah, I, I can't, you know, we're post lockdown now, and I said to Anna, who works with me here, I said, get me some appointments back out in industry next week. Because I need to get out there and the road, yeah, get back on the road. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like hearing your story there, mate. That was great. Yeah, it's a funny old story, isn't it? And my, um, I love my parents dearly, and uh, they passed away now, of course. But um, I remember, oh, I've got to tell you this very quick. Okay, when I got my teaching certificate. I, I used to go home every year to see my parents and I go, mum, mum, I've got the certificate. I was really proud of it, okay? But yeah, just pop it behind the radio, Jeff. Just pop it over there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want it on the fridge. <laughs> so about three years later, um, maybe five years later, I've got this uh, this bachelor of uh, this undergraduate uh, teaching qualification, okay? I've done my diploma. I've got a bachelor of, of uh, education leadership. I'm flying over to the UK. You, got, you guys go. So, I, hey, mum, what? Got the certificate. What is it, son? I would say, um, and my dad was there, and, oh, well, I've got a degree now, mum. Oh, that's lovely, Jeff. Just pop it behind the radio with the other one. Okay? Just <laughs> pop it over there. So, so I'm, you're flying back to Australia thinking, is it me? Is it them? Am I, am I, am I, yeah, am I, have I moved out of this? Am I getting above my station here? So I get this master's, okay? It's a big certificate, okay? I'm Now I'm feeling really good about myself. I fly back over to the UK, all right? I'm 20 years in. I mean, uh, you know, I, this has got to impress them. This is going to impress them. The, the sheer size alone, yeah. <laughs> hey, mum, yeah, what? <laughs> I got this certificate. Oh, lovely, son, what is it? What's, what you got there then? So I roll this thing out. I go, mum, it's a master's in education. It's really important. Oh, that's lovely, son. Just fold it up and put it behind the road. <laughs> I tell you what, like, it's a... Uh, it's Must a, have been plenty of room behind the radio. Uh, well, in the old days, actually, everything went behind the radios, the bills and everything. My uh, <laughs> Storage. I, I, um, I think they were very happy. Uh, and I think it was a... Um, my mum was always very careful to not let people get above their station. And to keep them grounded, okay. And uh, I, I love her. I love her for that. And uh, unfortunately, my wife maintains that standard for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. 
Do well, you want to talk a bit about the skills, Costa? What's on your What's on your list? I've got, I've got, I've got one more little question. Then we can get into the skills. Yeah, sure. I think um, now that we're on sort of the topic of sort of yourself and and your sort of path through, do you have any sort of goals for VACC going forward? Is yeah, anything you've got sort of a and you know undying desire that you you want to achieve? I the do. time you sort of hang yeah. hang the gloves up. I think um, every job you go into. You, your job is to make the place a better place and to leave it in better condition than you found it. That's not a criticism of people that were there before for you, mm. but you have got an obligation, in my view, to put in 120%. If you can't do it, don't do it. Um, mm. Taking up somebody else's space. Uh, associations are, by nature, um, they, they can be very traditional by nature, and my job here has really been to move the ACC um, into the 21st century. And, you know, I've done that. Um, you know, we've changed the constitution a couple of times. We've restructured. We've dropped one of the boards. We started a big commercial company called Our Auto that's doing very well. Um, we re honed the staffing here. We, we upped the capability in the organisation sold the building, we put the spare money from that in the member funds so that we've got good reserves for a long time so that we can actually give the members back more than they give us in funds. So, uh, you know, we, we, we give the members back more, uh, more than double what they pay us in, and we can do that through our investments, and that's a good use of member money to actually yeah, wow. we can give them additional services. Um, so that's about shifting an organisation, Costa, shifting the culture and shifting the view. And I've had good boards here to help me do that. I mean, boards, you know, it, it's not the CEO's job to agree with the board all the time or the board's job to agree with the CEO. If you if everybody agrees, you've got a problem. You can't agree all the time, okay? It's just not, doesn't, life's not like that. But if you can work with a board and, and go on this journey of renewal, I think that's a really important place to be. I think all associations need to take that on board, and I think they do. If you look at our new building, which is basically, it looks like a honeycomb, but it actually represents the grill of a Mustang. But the building is a looking to the future. The these inside of the building is about a modern environment. Um, the staff here, you know, I've got more staff here than are more highly educated. I've got people here with law degrees. My IR team are very well educated. It's about, you know, really lifting the game through the whole organisation. We talk about relevance in associations, and that, that is obviously if you don't have a relevance to your members, then you, you don't need to be there anymore. You Effectively, you've run out of, of life. There's always work for associations to do, to do because the business environment is always changing. There are challenges in that, in that environment. So my view is, is if an association thinks they're done, they're done because you never, my view is there's always more to do. Um, the association, and I can only talk about this association in Victoria, okay, we need to be um, highly focused around member services and member engagement and delivering on advocacy. One, without any shadow of doubt, to do that, Costa and Mike, when you appear in government at the, feet, at, the, at the steps of parliament in front of ministers, they need to know who you are, they need to respect you as an association, and they need to respect what you do, okay? And, and that's my job. My job is to make sure that this association is respected for what it does. Now, most associations in the MTAs, they're registered, registered the same as a union. Okay, under the Registered Organisations Commission, under the Registered Organisations Act. Effectively, you know, you could argue we're an association, we're, at a, we're in a, a union for employers, okay. When you look at the, the work that you do and when a minister makes a judgment about an association, this is the judgment they're going to make. How well have you worked for your members? Okay? And... and Another minister might make the same judgment about a union. They might say to a union uh, representative, how well have you worked for your members? 
But I think that applies to any association that if I'm a minister and I've seen this association, they're in the press, they've got a clear message, they've moved policy, their policy advice is sound, their advocacy is sound, that is the respect you need and you need to, that every day here, that is a journey and a, and, a, and a task for us to do inside the VACC. Um, we, this organisation will always change and my, my job here is to make it change and to make it move as the environment moves and where possible to get in front of the environment. The meeting I had before this meeting was about how are we going to engage in electric vehicle training. Uh, I'm in Europe with some of the other MTAs next year. We've got a, a global think tank happening around electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, new technology in vehicles. Now, what we want to bring back from that is, is a whole lot of new information back to Australia. But, you know, I might have five meetings in this building here every day. Most of those meetings internally are, are around what can we do better? What do we need to do next? What do members really need? How have we engaged? Okay, every day, every meeting here has, has got to be around those themes and they're, they're really important. So, Costa, um, for every association and every CEO, you know, you just hope that when you pass the baton, that, that, that the next person has got the, the energy and the drive and the will to take that baton and to do better and to build on what's been built before. And, uh, and, I, and I, I really hope that that happens here. And then the other MTAs, you know, as a, I know all of the, you know, we group up regularly, the other CEOs, we had a, a group up, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Um, I, I can tell you now, every one of them would want the same. And most of the things I've spoken to you guys about today, they're all doing it. They're, they're doing it their own way. Um, they're doing it with the resources that are available to them. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're tough gigs, you know, because I've got 5,000 members and, and any one of those can, members can ring me any time and I pick up my phone. On, you to ring me on the weekend, I'll pick my phone up um, and give me an opinion. Let me know how they're thinking. Uh, let me know if they think we should do more. And um, and that that's that's good, you know. I'm I'm okay with that. I mean, ring me and tell me what you want. I mean, tell me what you think we should do. Uh, but that's you know, anybody that wants to run an association, uh, they're they're very complicated jobs because you're 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 you've got huge influences coming at you, even in the industry between different divisions in the industry. Mm -hmm. What you might want to do for one division may actually impact harshly on another division. So, you Big know. balancing act, isn't it? It's a, it's a very careful balancing act. And um, sometimes you have to stand back and make decisions that are better for the whole industry, but might actually impact one part of the industry more severely. But you just have to, any association that's pulling in a broad group of members sometimes has to make the call on... They're the hard choices. They're the hard yeah, choices. what do I need to do make, right yeah. now to, to, for this industry? And coming back to Mike's point about, you know, lifting the profile of the industry and mm. collectively do that. Um, we have that discussion here regularly, but this is my journey and my, my message, actually, to my members here, and I've said it more than once. When I drive home and I stop at the traffic lights and I look to my right... And there's a dirty, grubby workshop with crap all out in the forecourt, signs hanging off. That's not my, that's not my problem. That's your problem because I can't change that. So I can spend years in front of ministers and I've spent a long time promoting automotive and trying to lift profile. But until uh, every member has a workshop that a mother looks at that workshop and says, I would put my kid in there, we cannot change anything because, because I can't tell a member how to run their workshop. Um, but if, 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 if a member comes to me and says, Jeff, we need to do more about the image of the industry and they're running a, a, a poorly represented workshop that looks like crap, 
Yeah. Don't give me that question. That's your question, not my question. Totally yeah, agree. I, th- I think, totally. you know, we always say don't judge on appearance, but unfortunately the, the facts are we do. Mm-hmm. And and that's something that definitely that a lot of us have to constantly be working on. And look, I think constantly changing, constantly evolving, that's probably the that's what most businesses should be doing. Yeah. It's actually oh, nice absolutely. to see that you guys are doing it on obviously a far larger scale. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's good to see because my biggest pet peeves, and we've discussed this before, um, you know, when you ask someone, oh, why are you doing it this way? And the answer is, well, we've always done it this way. <laughs> oh, it's like sending a, a, a knife through my heart. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's, uh, that's, right. um, yeah. I'm going to hit you up with a challenge at the moment, Costa. I reckon you know what we should do with the Garage Network? I think What's we it? should have a garage competition, like who's got the cleanest garage. I'll, I'll, and, I'll, and we'll get and we'll get Jeff to judge it. How's that, Jeff? Yeah, I yeah, like why it. Why don't we go around the country and do a garage? No problem. Well, <laughs> we'll I, get a prize for prize for the for the for the, and I'll stay really out of it because I, I think I already have Australia's cleanest garage. <laughs> you could I go know, the I other way and have a booby prize for the worst garage because actually profiling the ones that are doing the right thing that's a great thing to do. Yeah, but actually, worst gets a mop. Oh, uh, there are some of some of the bad ones. Um. Mums, by the way, mums are the predominant factor in the employment of young males. Yeah, wow. All right? There you go. The only lens in my view, not that we only want males in the industry, we need far more diversity, but you need to look at a workshop through the lens of a mother yeah. and make the call. And yeah. the, they would put their kids in or you'd put your son or daughter in yeah. The answer is no, then that's the problem. Yeah. But that perception, and the perception starts with us. Um, we need uh, to, all of us yeah. as 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 the as the mechanics and as the business owners, the perception starts with us. Absolutely. We, we, you, you guys and, are front of shop, and mm. um, I can't change that. <laughs> no, I know that. And, and you got to remember that my father-in-law said it to me years ago. He said, look, he said, he said it's it's people's second biggest investment. Yeah. Most people's second largest investment is their motor vehicle. Yeah. So you know, and, and he said, if, what, "Why? Why would they want to bring it to a shop where I don't know, that, like that looks like that?" <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. It, and it's, it's people aren't. You're not going to get work. I mean, we built this workshop here in 2015. We moved in, and I had people coming in um, on one of our old service station sites. We had to remediate it, um, and that that I had people coming in just going, "Can I just buy something?" Because I just want to look around. <laughs> I love I just, that. I like it because it looks like a Formula One. Oh, I love you know, it. And, it's, and, it's, and, it, and it's, it's like the, the we, we, we're continuously getting, I went and got to the service station yesterday and the guy goes, oh, 313 Automotive, you've got the cleanest workshop I drive oh, past. How do you man. keep it so clean? And he's just a service station attendant. And I said, I said, well, I flog my staff pretty hard, you know. I said, we crack them. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, but you can, eat, you can eat your breakfast off our workshop floor. So There are some great examples, Mike. I've got some members um, that have got really, really good workshops and I like them and, uh, and the people that work in them work there because they're like that. Yeah. And I, I really don't know how the, the ones further down the food chain are going to uh, manage with a with this lean employment market that we've got, Mike. Um, but gee, when you walk into a nice workshop, good floor covering, you know the gears are on racks. There's there, there's not shit all over the you know airlines all over the place. So I think they're great places, and yeah. the public know that. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure, definitely. Right. What what else you got, Costa? Well, um, I probably got a. Couple more. I'll hit you up with one more since you're giving me the time to. Why not? Um, <laughs> so obviously, I'm just going to knock this door in a minute. You're going to get. Yeah, you got to be careful. <laughs> the more you give me, mate, the more it's like give me an inch, I'll take a mile. Um, <laughs> so obviously, we've got, we're going to see some pretty drastic changes with um, data share and all this sort of stuff. Sort of starting to hit our doorstep shortly. Uh, where do you think that's going to take us? I know I think you spoke about it earlier. You know, it's going to start to sort of level out that playing field. It's not really an advantage, but start to level it out. Um, but what do you think, what sort of changes do you think we're going to see in the independent space? Well, there's a couple of things happening here. So the um, the data scheme, what's known as the scheme rules are just being finalised now, and they're the rules that will dictate what information you can get and how you can get it. 
Um, and uh, there'll be certain levels to that, but when you get up into the, the, security, the safety and security levels, there will be a fit for purpose requirement there. Um, so there will be more monitoring, if you like, of people going in and out of portals to get information. Um, I think what we're going to find is a big divide occurring in the industry, though, Costa, about people that seriously want to move into the new vehicle fleet. They want to tool up for it. They, they're willing to put the time and effort into their staff, particularly around the diagnostics and that sort of stuff. Um, and there's another group of people that are going to be the the last of the Mohicans, if you like, is they will just work on conventional vehicles and they will time that out. They'll be on a journey timing that out. Um, but And I think that, that there's no doubt it's going to be... I've been to some members, not so much recently, but before COVID came in and they said, look, I'm not buying all that gear. I'm, yeah. I'm just working on my old customer base. But all the time they've got their old vehicle, I'm going to work on them. Uh, and that's okay. That's their call. In terms yeah, absolutely. Of, but but there will be a there will there's definitely going to be a fork in the road. I, it'll, certainly in the next five years, where um, members are going to have to say, "Well, okay, what am I going to do here?" The thing is, if you take the left hand turn and you work on traditional vehicles, it's quite likely that when you come to sell that business, if you want to sell it five years down the track, that the value is less. In my view. If you want to take a right-hand turn and actually equip and, and put yourself in a particular market, um, I think you'll have a vibrant business and the, the business value um, would be greater because it's it's contemporary. Um, but I, I think the business, it's not, a, it's not a disaster. So, okay, let me give you a timeline, okay? Think of a car and think of a cat. They both last the same period of time. Yeah. So... When you buy, so they're, they're 10 to 15 years. So even if we had a rule tomorrow that said all vehicles are going to be electric, um, there's a big transition period here um, for Australia. And, I mean, we haven't got national policy on this, by the way, so it, it's sort of a bit near at the moment. We've got some time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, I, you know, as soon as an electric car, a good one, a useful one, hits the market at, you know, 35K. yeah. Uh, and we're down under 50 with some pretty good cars now. There's two more that came. I was reading this morning, there's two more at 55. So we're getting there. So I, I probably the market's going to determine what we do before policy because as, as they move into um, less internal combustion in production around the world, those cars, in my view, will actually become more expensive because there's no R&D occurring, but volumes you know when you make cars if you make a lot they're cheaper if you mm-hmm. make they're more expensive it's pretty straightforward um so i one of the challenges is going to be about the breadth of vehicles that people work across so in the olden days you know about 30 years ago most engines had similar technology and you could it's, the cars came into the garage and you fix them as you went as we move down into electric vehicles and more proprietary technology, you know, on, on Teslas and NGs and whatever vehicle that is, I'm not sure whether repair shops will be able to get across the range. And it's about whether the ranges start to get narrowed around, look, you know, here's five brands. We're a Euro brand or a North America brand or whatever, or whatever that mix is. And we've got a bit of that now anyway. But I've got a funny feeling if diagnostic equipment becomes too proprietary focused, that you're not going to buy a 50 grand uh, tool five times. You're not going to do mm. it. So it'll be, let's have a look at where the technology goes on scan tools and diagnostic equipment. But I've got a funny feeling the bandwidth is going to come in a bit. Um, but to come back to my, my point originally, Costa, um, you get... Repair shops are going to have to make a decision which way they're going to go because you you either have to gear up or make a judgment around. Look, I'm just going to work on the older stuff and I'll send the other stuff up the road. And look, you'll probably go okay because there'll be enough work in the market for a period of time. Yeah, but your business will ultimately be smaller. And you know, in, in ten or fifteen years, you're going to be working on a lot of old shit, and then that will disappear as well. I think I'm, I'm I will very strongly agree with you. I think yeah. 
And I'll probably see one thing to add to that because of the obviously you know, the proprietary branded tooling. Probably, I believe we'll probably see a few more sort of um, specialized shops. You know, the guys that just do certain well, brands. I think so. I, I think know? so. Yeah, definitely. It makes yeah. sense. You know, yeah, it yeah. does make sense. Yep. But um, no. But where 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 that where that will be problematic though, Costa is regional. So yeah, of course. Them, you can you're willing to drive six k's. Okay, they're, they're a Rivian specialist or they're a, a, yeah. a an MG specialist. Yeah, regionally you're sort of a bit stuck. Yeah, and, um, you know because you the distance, yeah, distance, and uh, so that that's going to be a bit more challenging out there. Yeah, of course. See, we always we we got the luxury of being in, in sort of Sydney CBD, so we we always forget about you know, that it is quite different. Out there. Yeah, yeah. You can like af- you could afford to repair one brand only in a metropolitan area. Yeah, that's right. Or we'll bring that work in through reputation. Yeah. You know, every two kilometers you go out, that that effect wears off. And if you if you you know as soon as you hit the the outer suburbs, you need to you need to be doing more than that. Yeah, of course. Mm. Excellent. Cool. Anything else you'd like to add to that, Jeff? Uh, not to that in particular. Anything um, in general? Uh, look, labour's our big challenge. Um, I think that uh, the, there is... What the, the challenge we've got is we've got this new electric car fleet coming through, which creates a, an assumption that the old stuff's old, old stuff. Mm. And our major job is going to be at the attraction of... We need about... 12 to 14,000 new apprentices starting an auto every year nationally. You need about 30,000 in training. Ideally, you need more than 50% of them to finish. We haven't had that those conditions for a while. And the slowdown we've had over COVID has really has put us five years back. So um, I'm a big advocate for having multiple labour pools, but I'm a big advocate for apprenticeship training. But we, there's, there's no way in the world that we're going to be, be putting on, on enough apprentices to have that labour coming through. So um, we will be needing to use international labour more, but um, that we've got to get government to focus on that. Um, you know, I still say to members now, you know, you should have a relationship with a local school. The yeah. labour force is over there, but there's no point turning up for a 10-minute session uh, at, at year 12, it's still too late. You've got to yeah. be with the same kids in year 9, 10, 11. So you've got to develop a relationship where every year you're going to a couple of local schools talking about the industry and your business. And um, I, I tell members this all the time, find the vet coordinator, find the careers coordinator. They're inundated with things, but just keep going, keep going. I'm here for the kids. Tell me what time you want me here. I'll be there. Um, what, where's the technology class? Why aren't I talking about technology in the technology class? Give me a 10-minute slot. I'll talk about technology. Mm. Uh, your your labour force is in your local schools, but you have to be in there three or four years out, same as politicians. Yeah. You, know, you need to be informing and encouraging and then capturing as, they, as they're coming out. Uh, it's no, it starts in year nine. I think that's what needs to really Yeah, do. it's a real, it's a relationship Um what will happen if you develop that relationship, the vet coordinator after three years is going to call you. And yeah. To you, they've got a kid that wants to go. The right like, person. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. Because they don't, a lot of the times, they also don't know sort of the changes either. They don't know anything. They don't know about that. They don't know anything. We, we are looking, in, in a lot of cases, we're, we're looking for those gamers and those guys that like computers. Right. They're perfect for us. That's right. You know, especially yeah. with the new <laughs> the new cars. Excellent, perfect. Send but they don't over. know that. They don't know that. Yeah. That's uh, right. They think it's all bad. And they, and they think that we're all still monkeys swinging on spanners in, yeah. in, in, a, in a greasy shop, in a terrible yeah. looking shop. They don't know that we have 15 scan tools, yeah. 20-odd computers in this yeah. place. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. it's crazy. But you have marble floors, Mike, as well. You've got marble yeah, like, floors. You've got your statues. We have, lobster, we have lobster Italian lobster thing, yeah. champagne for lunch. Yeah. The he's got that, marble yeah. floors, but he's painted over them, all right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Concrete marble. Lobster lunch. It's lobster excellent. Lobster lunch. Yeah. You know, pool, table, pool table in the lunch break. You have a game of snooker in your lunch break. Yeah. That's what we do. So. Well, I've got to tell you guys about this, that, You've got to hold on to the people you've got if, if they're good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still saying, 
Um, you know, the, the 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 barbecue on a Friday. Yeah. The uh, tickets to the theatre. You know, the, the you know, there's a fruit hamper that was delivered to their home on a Friday. It's not big stuff. It's the things that you do. Yeah. That. Um, that just make a small difference. I mean, my boys are really easy, Jeff. Yeah, make sure there's that, that fridge is full of Corona. Yeah, well, the, well, but you know what? It, it, that that's what does it. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the it's the thing you give that you don't need to give. And the, and the, the pool table, I can see it. Yeah. The <laughs> table, that's very good. Um, it's the things you give that you don't need to give that make the difference. Look over yeah. a bit here. We were writing to our staff, you know, we we're writing letters, handwriting letters to our staff, telling them about what we're doing here. We we'll want them back in the office when they can and just encouraging them all that we were sending fruit parcels to their doors, with so chocolate stuff to their doors. Um, uh, we didn't have to do any of that. We did it because it was the right thing to do. But as I've spoken to members and, and, and people in the industry for years, I remember there was an auto lack. South Australia, really good shop. And I said, uh, well, how do you keep your people here? You don't have workers there for 25 years. How do you keep your people here? He goes, well, I just do really simple things. I give them you know, tickets to the cinema. Um, there were, he had an apprentice there. There was a, an old car at the back. It's today, Reggio. He said, we'll just use the car. Cost him nothing. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, Reggio. Um, and, it, and it's these... Employers, I, I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this, okay? And I'm not, it's not my recommendation, but I'm just going to tell you. There's an employer that I know who will walk around a workshop out of the blue and he'll give his workers 100 bucks each cash, okay? Out of nowhere, okay? And they love him. Hmm. And, and it wouldn't matter if it was 20 or 100 it's just what it is. It's, it's just, an appreciation, I think. It's like you feel they feel a bit more appreciated. That's, you know? that's workplace culture. That's a good. You've got a great culture at the VACC by what you guys just did in, yeah. during COVID. That's yeah. you're looking after your staff. You know, like yeah. I think someone said, "What is culture?" I think it's culture is how you how you. It's everything. It's all of the above. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's all. It's what you just said. You just explained it beautifully. Yeah. Well, so, anyway, I think it's the small things and. Uh, thanking people. Hmm. Yeah. There's a guy, I, again, it's my last secret. Can you, I'm just going to share this with you. Again. It's just between us, mate, again, like I said. I'm so, I sit here and I've got a team of people out here and there's a guy on the phone out there, okay? And, all right, I've got to get off. Yeah, I've got to get off. Too many secrets. Too many secrets. And um, I'm listening on to the phone and his phone manner is absolutely magnificent and I hadn't heard him before because we've had to move down to another floor before we move out of the building. And one day he was going home and I stopped him and I said, you know, your phone manner is the best phone manner I've ever heard. And if I had a problem, I'd want you to fix my problem for me because <laughs> I reckon you're fantastic nice. on the phone. That guy, that guy there, nobody's ever told him that. Hmm. Nobody's, ever told, nobody's ever stopped him and told him that. And he felt like a million dollars. 100% you would. But I actually meant it because I actually, the guy has got a fantastic phone. I thought, I'm going to tell this guy that he's actually a really good guy and he's doing a really good job. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's just. I mean, we've got to praise people for it. That's really a really good point. That's really, you know. Hey, guys, I've got a yeah. time out of the window. Yeah, no. Nah. I'm supposed oh, to be chairing another meeting. Here's another guy who's got his thumb up. I'm in yeah. trouble. I've got to yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Anyone, just quickly before we go, you got to, you can check out Jeff Jeff on the uh, the Grill podcast as well. You give you ah yes any more stuff. Yeah, have a look at that. Now, see, see the check Grill. Have a look at that. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. You very much. much. Pretty. Thanks for your time, mate. I love the Thanks, chat. Jeff. Really appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Bye, bye. Don't forget to join our private Facebook page if you are an automotive technician. And also subscribe to our YouTube and our podcast channel. They are all called The Garage Network. Thanks, guys, and see you next time.